So, um, yeah, those are some thoughts. In terms of what rate did I get stronger on the main lifts, um, I had a video I made a little bit ago going over some of my old training footage. And a lot of people were surprised that a skinny young Sam, uh, I was still like close grip bench in three plates. And I looked, I looked very, very, uh, normal looking guy. Um, you know, I was like squatting four and a half plates and I was pulling like five plates at that time. Um, I progressed pretty quickly. I thought there was some, definitely some hard plateaus, but the aptitude for like high force output was very much there from the get-go. I've kind of always been a very fast twitch guy, uh, very explosive, and that scaled from being explosive in a sporting context uh, to being powerful in a lifting context relatively quickly. Um, and as I filled out my frame and became more technically competent, put on more primary movers, that's kind of yielded me better and better results. Um, historically, how differently... Ha if at all, have you programmed the overhead press from your bench press? Uh, so usually I program it very, very similarly. Just kind of success leaves clues. Uh, I've put a lot of work into my programming for my bench press. I figure the overhead press is going to be relatively similar in volume demands, maybe slightly more because the absolute tonnage is lower. So I basically, every time I've made a big push on my overhead press, I have followed training very similar to my bench press. Now, once I do this 600 bench press and I shift my uh, emphasis to becoming um, as good of an overhead athlete as I can be, uh, I probably am going to observe some small differences, but I think as a starting point, if you have a general kind of observations for what works for you for bench press, you can definitely get away with scaling those to the overhead as your starting point. And that is what I have done as well. Next one. What do you think of soreness after a lift? The science bros will say any soreness at all, and you overdid it. But bro scientists will say more soreness uh, is generally better. Where do you fit in? Um, on a similar topic, what ideas do you have in regards to training and nutrition you think the science has not caught up to yet? So what the science has not caught up to yet is uh, program design because there just isn't much research on it. Uh, there's no funding for it because there's not state-funded programs for powerlifting, really. Uh, there aren't state-funded programs for strongman. Um there just isn't funding for it, right? So it's like, that's not to say, oh, the science doesn't get it. There just isn't much science on it for what training looks like for higher and higher level athletes, uh, what general trends we observe. We're, we're more still at the base of like, okay, here's the basic physiological principles that we're observing. Um, but when it comes to the training of athletes that get more and more advanced, there just isn't much research there. Um, that's not a knock on the research. It just means we probably have to look uh, to different kind of forms of evidence. And that's where coaches, I think, are very valuable because one athlete, they truly do have an N of one. All they really know is what's worked for them. Um, but a coach has had a sample size of probably a few hundred athletes if they've been doing this for a long time. Um, and that's, it's less rigorous, it's less structured, but that does kind of act as a greater sample size for a study of sorts. Through their trial and error, they've probably come to some theories on what works best on average. And that's where I would look to someone who's got a long history of coaching, a wide variety of different kinds of athletes, tested, untested, men, women, super heavyweights, smaller lifters, uh, and have produced good results across those lifters, right? Um, I'm very keen to hear what they have to say in terms of observations, right? Because we don't have much literature um, past a certain point of program design. But in terms of soreness, I don't think you're right. I think a lot of the science bros say that don't say that soreness you means you overdid it. I think they just mean soreness doesn't mean it was a good workout. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get sore, right? Uh, Dr. Mike had a very good couple of talking points when he went on FOAD's podcast a while ago where he basically said, um, just because you didn't get sore doesn't mean it wasn't a good workout. And just because you got sore doesn't mean it was, right? Um, that's, that's, I agree with that 100%, right? You can run a marathon, you'll be sore as shit, but how you got sore kind of informs what adaptations are going to happen. If you got sore from a stimulus that we generally think of as poor for hypertrophy, we're probably not going to see much hypertrophic adaptation. But Dr. Mike basically kind of laid out, there's kind of three things he likes to observe, not because they create a good workout, but because they correlate it with it. He said, quality of pump, soreness following the workout, 
and acute fatigue during the workout. So your performance on that muscle decreasing because it's fatigued, right? So we can't just replicate our first effort at the end. Our strength has fallen off. So we have this dec- like this acute decrease in performance from fatigue. And he generally likes to see all three, three of those things present. Now, if one of them isn't present, that isn't the end of the world. I've had periods of training where um, I was very acclimated to this high training load. I was pushing my calories really hard and I saw some of the best muscular growth I've ever seen and I wasn't regularly getting sore. That being said, I've also had periods where I was regularly getting sore and I saw good gains, right? So um, soreness doesn't mean good or bad workout, but I do think it tends to correlate with good workouts a lot of the time. If someone's never getting sore, that might be because they're firing on all cylinders and things are going well and they're growing well, or it could also be that they're habitually under training and they're not actually pushing to the limits that we uh, kind of deem to be hypertrophically stimulative. So if someone never ever gets sore and they don't see this acute fall off in uh, performance, I think that would be an indicator to try either doing more sets or pushing your existing sets harder. I definitely fall in line with kind of the, the if then scenarios Dr. Mike laid out in that podcast. If that's something you're interested in, I would definitely give that a listen. Um, we just got a couple more here. Would you program push press slash push jerk differently to, from how you would program a, a, a strict press? Um, if either was the main movement and why? Uh, definitely I would train them very, very differently. One of, like, let's say a push jerk is a very technical movement uh, and training is going to be very different than something like a strict press, which is a not very technical movement, which is more just about the contractile property of our muscles, putting on just as much tissue in those primary movers as we can. It's not profoundly technical. Whereas something like a push jerk uh, has power qualities that we're trying to preserve. We don't want to be doing these high rep sets where we're getting slower and slower and we're drilling sloppier and sloppier movement patterns. Our, our reps are going to be usually lower and our number of sets are going to be higher. Whereas something that's a little bit of a dumber lift, uh, like the strict press, we got this bigger emphasis on just putting on muscle, bigger emphasis on hypertrophy, where we're going to be uh, okay with taking higher repetition sets where the bar speed starts getting really slow at the end. Um, because we're looking for, for cross-sectional area of the primary movers. Whereas the push jerk, we're looking for more power qualities and technical uh, excellence. So we're trying to do it more often, preserve these power qualities. So uh, definitely very different in how I would program those. Beep, boop, bop, boop. Um, appreciate nutrition is out of your realm of exper- ex- expertise. Um, but in your view, how do phases of training impact calorie intake? For example, if someone is bulking, uh, Would calories be lower in a strength and peaking phase compared to a base building phase Um, due to potentially vastly different volumes in training? Thanks. Um, Yes, I would say if you have an athlete that is an experienced dieter and they're very, very consistent with their variables, they're consistent with their step count, uh, you probably would see a greater caloric intake through the hypertrophy phase just because, like you said, the workload being performed is larger um, and thus right? The caloric expenditure is larger. So the amount of calories we need to eat to reliably get into a surplus is a bit higher. That being said, I think that 95% of athletes, if not more, are not so precise with their nutrition and so precise uh, with their step count that they really have the privilege of being able to make those scaling adjustments in phases of training. They're just trying to make sure they're reliably eating the same amount. And that's more of the struggle rather than kind of optimizing the ups and downs of that amount. So I think most athletes aren't at the level of uh, skill in the process of dieting where we start taking low days on rest days and high days on peak training days. And we have our calories a little higher through the hypertrophy phase, a little lower through the strength and the peaking phases. Um, that's something an experienced diet would absolutely do. I think you're very much onto something there. I just most think most people need to be shifting that focus to the fundamentals of getting their meals in consistently. Um, and then past that, optimizing those meals and then past that, then they can start moving into having some more variability in these meals and have that target be moving with time. But first and foremost, most people need to put in a few years of practicing just hitting a target that's always in the same spot rather than introducing more complexity. The next one, should arm dominant lifters count compound presses like overhead press and bench press in their weekly triceps volume? So I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. It doesn't matter. Uh, And here is why it doesn't matter. Whether you count it or not, right? Let's say you had, I don't know, 10 sets of overhead and 10 sets of bench press across the week. 
Um, that's a pretty decent, that's a pretty hefty training load. So you've done 20 sets of triceps. That doesn't change the fact that once, okay, whether we say it's 20 or whether we say that's zero, we then feel out how many sets of direct elbow extension we can do on top of that. So whether we say, oh, well, I can only do 10 um, or whether that 10 is actually 30 because we're adding in the 20, set, the 20 sets we've done of uh, compound pressing. Uh, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, the language we use to describe it, it's describing the same thing whether we count it or not. Uh, because once we've kind of hit our upper ends of overhead and benching and we kind of feel out, okay, well, I can do X, Y, Z number of extra tricep sets, whether we call it that or that plus the compounds doesn't really matter. And it doesn't change what you're doing in the end result. So whether you count it or not, the end result's kind of the same thing. Uh, last couple of questions. Why are different lifts trained differently? What makes a particular lift more or less reliant on accessories, more suited towards higher or lower frequencies, etc.? So um, I, I like Josh Bryant's phrasing of it because it's simple. Some lifts are smart lifts and some lifts are dumb lifts. And they try to just, he, that just kind of means how technical they are. Uh, something like a snatch and a clean and jerk is a very smart lift. It's very, very technical. And generally, the more technical a lift, the more often we need to do it to see forward progression or maintenance of those technical qualities, right? Whereas something like a conventional deadlift or a close grip bench press is a relatively dumb lift, right? It's not all that skillful. So we don't have to do um, the lift as often. And it's probably going to be more reliant on just how big our primary movers are, what is our peak force we're able to output. Uh, and then in terms of the Olympic lift as well, um, being fundamentally different, or maybe a push press or a push jerk, um, there's a power component, right? So we don't want to be drilling slow reps in training. So that changes things. Uh, and when you have some of these lifts, the absolute load is also going to inform something. So something like a deadlift where the absolute load is very high, that's probably going to drag. So it's like a dumb lift with a very high absolute load. That's gonna drag our frequency down. Something like a snatch, where the load is lower uh, and the skill curve is very high, it's a smart lift, that's gonna drag our frequency way up. Um, and then also, like we talked about, some lifts, because we're focused on power qualities, uh, we want to probably be doing greater number of sets to get in our workload, but the reps per set are lower. Um, that way we're never kind of doing slow reps. And then some lifts where, no, the ability to move slow is a skill. Then we're probably going to be doing maybe a little bit more reps per set and we're okay with that. So uh, those would be some things that come to mind. The next one, how would you generally program for an athlete who competes in multiple strength sports, uh, i.e. strongman and powerlifting or weightlifting and powerlifting? Um, I would have them try to strike a off season balance of just enough work to be getting better at their main competition disciplines in both. So we would try to find it and it's going to mean their results are not going to be as good as an athlete that's focused on one or the other, just the nature of, of training economy, right? But we're going to try to find a happy medium of how to distribute. And this is going to be their norm. Their norm is kind of what they're working on in the off season. And then when they approach a closer proximity to one or the other kind of competition. Um, our training is going to skew from 50-50, maybe all the way to like 90-10, right? Where we're really, really putting um, the other sport on maintenance at best or even um, almost com out completely. And then we drop back to our norm in the off season. And then maybe we do the other sport and we shift things this way. Uh, and the nice part is if we can make slow progress on this 50-50 split in this off season norm, uh, the athlete gets to enjoy a heightened rate of progression when we start increasing increasing that split towards the upcoming competition. So they get to feel like they're gaining more and more and more momentum into the contest when, let's say, they start approaching the strongman contest and their, str their training looks like 80, 90, 100 percent strongman focused as they get closer. It really helps them build mental momentum into it. Um, and they need to be okay with not being at their absolute best at both sports all the time. Just kind of a, a principle of periodization. I'm okay with the fact that during a hypertrophy phase, my bench press is, my, if, I, if you said, Sam, come in and hit a 1RM, it's going to be down. I'm okay with that because the goal right now is to be good at sets of 6 to 12 and to get bigger muscles uh, and then transition into being good at sets of 3 to 6 and then be good at one to three. Uh, and once you've done that enough times, you don't get afraid of that detraining because you know how quickly it retrains if what you're doing in the meantime is what you should be doing. So I'm not scared of it at all. I let my bench come down and then I push it back up. Um, and rather than trying to maintain the ability to duplicate our peak performance at all times. Uh, other than leverages, why do you think 
that some people excel at certain lifts other than more than others. Um, really, I think a lot of it's enjoyment and identity. Like if you see a little bit of initial success in a lift, you start to think of yourself as, oh, I'm the squat guy. And because you think of yourself as a squat guy, you go watch a bunch of videos. So you get more skillful at the squat and you reliably push it up and up and up because your identity revolves around it, right? And even if it wasn't the lift that you've got the leverages for, like sometimes I know some guys that are deadlift guys that really shouldn't be deadlift guys, but they because they watched some edgy George Lehman, Pete Rubish videos when they were first lifting and they decided that was the coolest lift, they dumped a bunch of their training economy into it, they learned a lot more about it, and because they cared about it and they really put thought into it for a long period of time, they started to get this really good intuitive feel for, okay, what is it that I need to do if I wanna get that 10 pound deadlift PR. Now, the question is if I have the motivation to do it, but after doing this for a very long time, I have a very good feel for what it would take, right? So I think that's part of it is just reaching that level of mastery out of love for a certain lift. I think that's a lot of it. Um, all right. Last three questions. Asking all of the noble natties, what is the difference between an RDL and a stiff leg deadlift to you? Well, I am neither noble nor am I natty, but I would personally kind of view them as a very similar movement pattern uh, where the stiff leg is done dead stop to the floor and the RDL is either reversed above the floor or done touch and go. Um, Sebastian Oreb made a little visual comparing the two, uh, talking about how they're the same fundamental movement pattern with a slight difference in execution, um, and how maybe the stiff leg lends itself slightly more to the strength side of things, um, because overcoming that weight dead stop on the floor is a skill very specific to the deadlift and very helpful. And the RDL, because it lends itself to volume, is probably more helpful on the hypertrophy side of things, though both do a very good job of both. And I would agree with that assessment. Uh, second to last question. Do you have an off season type training or you just keep repeating the same training cycle over and over? Uh, it depends, right? I definitely have an off season type training because when I'm approaching a strongman contest, I got to be working on those. Uh, and by definition, off season would be what I work on when I don't have a competition on the horizon. Um, so definitely I do have an off season, but that off season does consist of repeating the same eight to 12 week effort trying to see a bolstered result each time. It is very repetitive. Now, what? but as I approach a certain thing, yeah, that, chain, that, that training does change. So off season is kind of working on these broad categories of what I feel makes a good strong man. So yes, I do. And then the last one is what is the dumbest thing a client of yours has ever done? Spontaneous 50 pound deadlift PR attempt while in a volume phase, that kind of stuff. I'm sure you must have a funny story or two. So I was thinking about it. And I was like, ah, man, like I've, I have guys go off program every now and then and they'll do a big lift and usually they get it. And I'm like, ah, maybe you shouldn't have done that, but I'm okay with it. Good. Congrats on the PR. Um, if they miss, I, I will usually just tell them they're an idiot and that's fine. And let's get back on the program. The reason you missed is because you weren't supposed to back to that point. Congrats. Right. So I was thinking about it and I, I had to think about it a long time. Uh, and, but I do, I do have an answer. I had a guy when I was a lot newer to coaching, uh, my coaching was more off the back of just one or two successful clients that I had and maybe a little bit of my own lifting, but I was not viewed as an authority figure. And some of the guys that would hire me, uh, did not show me the same like level of respect that my clients nowadays do where I'm considered at least a little bit more of an authority. Um, I had a guy without telling me do a 20 pound water cut to try to break a teen state record because he just wasn't strong enough in the weight class he was actually in. And I, I'll mention this really quick. Um, the, the guys that make these water cuts for local meets, it's so silly because we're delaying our improvement as an athlete. Uh, usually the reason this happens is because someone looks at the records for the state and they say, oh man, if I was one or two weight classes down, I'd be right there. Um, so there's, oh, I just have to cut because it's easier for them to imagine cutting 20 pounds and retaining all of their strength than it is for them to imagine continuing to train productively and getting stronger to where they're just actually good in the class that they're in. Um, when in reality, it's funny because the one that they view as less viable is the much easier of the two. Um, nobody makes a 20, 25 pound cut coming into a meet and then goes nine for nine and their strength is the exact same as the beginning of the cut. It never goes that way. Nobody does a water cut that's drastic and it doesn't affect their performance at all, even though they've got no water cutting experience. Because if you said, hey, Sam, the reason I missed my deadlift at the end of this training cycle was because I, I didn't drink any water the day before. I'd say, yeah, you're an idiot. What did you expect? They'd be like, yeah, no, that's my bad. 
Why are we doing that on purpose before we're supposed to perform maximal lifts? If that is, that's the same thing you would cite as an excuse if you did it in training, why is it suddenly going to be okay? Uh, you don't have the experience of these high level athletes. Like just, just try to hit PR totals over and over and build into it with time. Everybody thinks they've got this shortcut of, Oh, I'll just cut 30 pounds, maintain my strength. And then I'll be a really good 165. It never fucking works. So this guy didn't tell me makes a 20 pound water cut almost bombs out and then fires me because he said the peak, uh, didn't work and that he, he must've peaked two weeks out because he was much stronger prior to the 20 pound water cut. So that's the dumbest thing a client's ever done. Um, I thank you. Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate you as always.